Well, in continuing with the line of thanks, I'd like to uh, just echo what Nicola said earlier and thank all the members uh, of the uh, Convention Committee who have been working very hard, diligently, every minute of the day, as we can see here. Um, starting with, with Mario, of course, who's uh, done a wonderful job as the, the local host and the arrangements chair, securing this wonderful uh, location here. Uh, Annalisa, who's been working diligently, constantly at every moment. Um, Nicola as well, the, the programme chair, has done a wonderful job and uh, the wonderful student assistants, uh, Renaud Everard and uh, Louis Sanyers, who I noticed has an AV slave uh, on his, his tag. I don't know if that means audio-visual slave or Annalisa Ventola's slave, I'm not quite sure. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> And of course, I'd like to thank the, or the program chair um, for <laughs> refereeing all the, the great papers we have here. And of course, uh, you, the audience and the delegates for, for making this uh, convention what it is. And I'd like to invite you all to uh, next year, come and join us when we'll be um, exercising the, the truly international aspect of, of the Parapsychological Association and going to Brazil. So maybe some of you can join us there. Uh, I think Curitiba. <coughs> So, uh, without ado, I will carry on with the talk. Um, I have been known to nod off myself occasionally in talks. It's been a long day. Uh, that's okay if that happens. I won't kind of single you out. We can consider it a, a, a synapse, perhaps. Uh, worry about it. Anyway, yeah, so. Um, <laughs> So it's great to have so many uh, wonderful characters here um, in the field. Uh, were uh, Sir Isaac Newton in my place now, he would say that he only got here probably by standing on the, the shoulders of giants. And uh, I rather regret that Isaac Newton isn't here, standing where I am, or sitting where I am, because he would probably do a better job. But uh, <coughs> nevertheless, I have taken a few tips from uh, his book, and I've looked through all the presidential addresses of previous years, and there's a current theme a uh, continuous theme recurring. Uh, in looking through the past presidential addresses then, I found that people continually said that we can both gain something and give something uh, to other fields of inquiry um, through our own research endeavours. And the, the fields highlighted to benefit from this cross-fertilisation are usually physics, biology and, of course, psychology. And I would echo that sentiment, but I also add some other fields and subfields to that list and reassert um, our intentions to spread our research into other areas and have a valued interaction with the fields of uh, anthropology, archaeology, ethnobotany, phytochemistry, neurobiology, psychopharmacology and uh, closer branches such as transpersonal psychology. And that's where this talk's going to go. Um, one particular point of contact where all of these disciplines and subdisciplines connect is through the study of consciousness and in particular its altered states uh, and primarily my own interest is through the use of psychoactive substances and the re-emerging area of research in, into psychedelic uh, substances and by psychedelic I take the definition from Grinspoon and Bacala that psychedelics are uh, substances that cause qualitative changes in one's consciousness uh, without causing any physical or mental addiction in the process. Now, the re relationship to parapsychology of this relatively uncharted region of, of investigation has been one of my main academic areas of interest. Um, and if you'll allow me to take you on a short journey down the metaphoric rabbit hole, um, I hope to show you why I grow forever curiouser and curiouser. Some ancient origins of Psy, as we all know, can be traced back to the historical record on the one hand with the Oracle of Delphi in ancient Greece. The uh, seeresses would sit upon a stool and prophesize in, in delirious altered states, um, which some researchers have identified as being caused by hydrocarbon gases issuing up from the fissures in the rocks. Um, another theory holds that the psychedelic plant henbane uh, was used in the temple because the plant was once called Pythonian uh, in honour of the, the goddess who was venerated there, Python, who was later slayed by Apollo and 
then henbane became sacred to Apollo as well. Um, so that was one possible cause for the uh, oracle's uh, prophecies. Spreading the net wider and further back into prehistory, we find remnants of shamanism going back millennia in all directions across the globe. Uh, even though we cannot be certain that the magical practices we find in the historical anthropological record mimic what our ancestors in prehistory did, but what we do know is that of shamanism in more recent times is that the practitioners of, our, of this art utilize these techniques of altering consciousness to access states conducive to clairvoyance, to precognition, to telepathy, to psychic diagnosis, to the communication with spirits. And they do so in the name of their community. And the techniques that they've used to get into these altered states of consciousness can be crudely summed up as the uh, five Ds, um, though there are more. Drumming, dancing, dreaming, diet, and of course drugs. Um, now it's with this last category that I have been doing most research and I found reports of the intentional use of these uh, psychedelic substances uh, across all five continents from the use of uh, nicotine rich paturi uh, amongst the indigenous people of Australia uh, to um, detura on the Indian subcontinent, the use of the iboga plant in Africa, the Syrian rue in the Middle East, mandrake in Europe, Amanita muscaria, which is a mushroom in the Arctic. And then we have a whole medicine cabinet full of, of different psychedelic plants we find in, in Mexico, ranging from the use of peyote amongst the Huicholi Indians in the north to the use of uh, psilocybin mushrooms by the uh, Mazatec Indians uh, in the south. They also use uh, another plant called Salvia divinorum. There's a great number of these, not to mention, of course, in, in South America, where we find an enormous pharmacopoeia of natural plant psychedelics that have been used traditionally for millennia. For instance, we heard earlier today about the use of uh, the Amazon jungle decoction ayahuasca, and it's been used, for instance, by healers to diagnose illness, perhaps by, uh, they explain, by looking inside the body of, of the, uh, the afflicted in a kind of X-ray vision way. Um, now, early researchers of this uh, uh, substance, ayahuasca, would uh, even contain, even sorry, even uh, named the first alkaloids they isolated from it, telepathy, as I briefly mentioned earlier. And that's because of the, the psychic experiences people report having with these substances. Now, strictly speaking, of course, uh, it would be a, a misnomer to call these substances drugs uh, in, in the classical sense, in the medical sense, because um, the context of use does not fit very well in a medical model. So, for instance, let's have a, a thought experiment here. Imagine going to your uh, doctor to find out what's wrong with you, and uh, instead of her prescribing you some, some drugs for the illness that she perceives you have, uh, she instead pops open the... the the tablets and takes them herself, and then uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> and starts to then diagnose your illness and uh, starts singing and blowing tobacco smoke over your head. Um, so we can't rightly call these things drugs in that traditional sense. And the the different names that these substances have rather depend on the different intellectual territory that they occupy in in, in the way in which people use these words. So for law enforcement agencies, they, they are drugs, quite clearly. For medical and traditional scientists, they're usually considered to be hallucinogens because they cause hallucination. But this term conveniently obscures much more than it, it reveals as, as, a, as a word. For therapists and people researching the potential benefits of these substances, they call them the more, I think, neutral term, psychedelic, which means mind manifesting. So they just tend to manifest whatever is happening in your mind at the time. Those looking at these substances through a, a spiritual lens tend to call them entheogens, entheogen, uh, creating God within. Um, 
And this is used to indicate their capacity to induce mystical experiences and uh, their propensity to be used in a sacramental manner, which they can be found properly in this use uh, among shamans or amongst some of the uh, religious movements uh, we have, such as the Native American church in the US who use peyote, or the Santa Daime church, for instance, in, in Brazil, which use ayahuasca. However, perhaps more accurately, as uh, Stan Krippner has uh, pointed out, they could should probably be called potential entheogens, that they have the, the potential, the, the capacity uh, to induce these kinds of mystical experiences or spiritual experiences, um, but only when the, 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 the right, have the right circumstances, only when we have the right set and setting. And that is when the person is in the right frame of mind and has the right environment. The rogue psychologist Timothy Leary one is one unequivocally useful contribution to the study of psychedelics is the notion of set, setting and substance, uh, that these are all important determinants for the psychological outcome of, of a psychedelic trip. Um, but the, the, the idea of the substance could in fact be, needn't be a psychedelic substance, it could be any mind-altering technique, be that LSD or uh, over-breathing, holotropic breath work or the Gansfeld induction, for instance. So these principles of set, setting and substance can fruitly, fruitfully be applied to a shamanic journey or a psi experiment uh, utilising altered states. And in journeying to, into these uh, shamanic realms of these uh, usually other cultures, it's clear that a richer connection needs to be forged between our field and the, the field of anthropology. So I recently conducted a review of the overlap between these two fields and found that there still remained a clear divide between what anthropologists did and what parapsychologists did in researching the paranormal in other cultures. Now, anthropologists, we'll start with them, tended not to consider the ontological basis of the apparently paranormal. Uh, so they care very little for actually proving or disproving the validity of the phenomena they're actually looking at. And, uh, or more often, the, the phenomena they were informed about secondhand. And that was quite a common approach until, of course, the formation of the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness and its earlier incarnations in the 1970s. Now, up until that time, virtually all anthropologists were of the public opinion that the paranormal was merely delusional, uh, primitive thinking, and that the only approach to subject matter was to treat it as an irrational belief. Um, fortunately, there was a revolution occurred in anthropology, oh, oh, oops. <laughs> with uh, Joseph Long in 1974, meeting at the American Association, uh, American Anthropological Association. And uh, researchers in the field began taking a more open-minded approach to the study of magic and the paranormal in other cultures at that point. Um, but only very few began conducting any kind of controlled psi experiments, um, such as Patrick Geisler and Michael Winkerman in the 1970s and 1980s. However, this trend didn't advance very far despite the continuing growth of anthropology of consciousness. And even now, very few anthropologists who study the paranormal phenomena and transpersonal experiences uh, are concerned with ontology, the, the reality of the phenomena under study. Oh dear. On the flip side, in the past, we had parapsychologists who conducted cross-cultural research into the paranormal but who generally attempted to do field psi experiments without applying any of the cultural insights that are gained from years of ethnography and the immersion in a different culture. I could give numerous examples from the literature. Uh, I'll probably just do one. Was Robin Taylor honestly admitted his, his naive, naive assumption that rural Fijians, so people from Fiji, I can't quite pronounce that, uh, would understand the principle of a random number generator. Um, my own experience probably suffices though in attempting to persuade an Ecuadorian shaman 
I just met that uh, he should let me do a, a precognition experiment in his uh, in his ceremony. He gave me a, a rather clear but indirect answer, and he, he kind of pointed me towards the four directions and blew a large conch shell of my backside. Um, there was to be no use of computers uh, in his ceremonies, and, and that was that. Um, back in the 80s, Patrick Geisler, for one, was very well aware of this uh, methodological disparity between the two fields and he proposed a multi-method approach to the study of what he called psi in process. Now using multiple methods involved using ethnography to inform experimental design and the psi in process approach utilized naturally occurring variables so that no artificial factors were forced across the cultural divide. In this manner, Geisler began with a specific experimental design which, which developed over time as it was informed by the ethnography he conducted. And his, in the end, his experiment resembled, in as many ways as possible, a client's consultation with a shaman to obtain knowledge about the location of a lost object. So he used a, a natural uh, uh, occurring scenario to base his experiment on. Now, very little of that kind of what we call, what Geisler called anthropological parapsychology has uh, actually been conducted or is being conducted these days. Though I would say that the, one of the few attempts uh, to adopt this rather in-depth Geislerian methodology is that of Serena Roni Dougal uh, in her immersive approach to studying yogis and uh, Tibetan lamas, uh, sorry, yes, and Tibetan Buddhist meditators, uh, mostly in India. Now, one of the few drawbacks of Geisler's ethnographically informed experimental approach, however, is that it requires a very long-term commitment to live among the people you study, often for several years. And Serena has done extensive work, uh, which she should be commended for in this regard, uh, spent the best part of six years living uh, in ashrams and monasteries in India uh, to conduct her research. And the science process approach can usefully, usefully be applied also to our indigenous research here in our, our own cultures uh, by looking at everyday occurrences of psi. Uh, the biologist Rupert Sheldrake, of course, has recent, in recent years picked up the baton and been running with it in this regard. Um, it was research into ordinary everyday psi experiences like the sense of being stared at and telephone telepathy. I was going to say. That's probably Rupert. Uh, okay. Um, and even text message and email telepathy too. <laughs> um, but the kinds of everyday psi experiences we have here in, in Europe, often everyday experiences, often look rather pale compared to the colourful ones that are occurring under the influence of psychedelics. Uh, to give an example, one year, Stanley Krippner was uh, very kind to bring along the anthropologist Jeremy Narby, who uh, talked about his fascinating research with ayahuasca. Um, now, Narby had been talking to a lot of shamans and was impressed by the inordinate number of times they talked about seeing two intertwined snakes. And some would also talk about going inside and seeing their own DNA. Um, and he took the, the image of the intertwined snakes to represent the DNA symbolically. So unlike most anthropologists, particularly those of the, the past, Nami, Nabi didn't just uh, leave his speculation there, but he arranged to take three molecular biologists out to the Amazon jungle for their first trip there, and indeed their first uh, ayahuasca trip. Now, all three of the biologists uh, had visions on the, on the psychedelic brew which helped them gain insight into their own research um, and ultimately they all changed their world, world view as well in the process. For instance, one of the biologists who worked on the Human Genome Project uh, said she saw a chromosome from the perspective of a protein flying along uh, a strand of DNA and that gave her insight into her, her research in the Human Genome Project. Um, these accounts aren't isolated, however, um, 
Outside of anthropology, we have a similar account coming from the biochemist Carrie Moulis, uh, who received the uh, Nobel Prize a few years ago for inventing the polymerase chain reaction, which uh, significantly advanced DNA research, uh, forensic research, the Human Genome Project, etc. And uh, he said he was able to do that by taking LSD, he said, which had enabled him to help visualize sitting on the DNA molecules and watching the polymerase go by. Um, now, it's also been announced uh, recently um, amid some controversy, and it's quite possibly apocryphal, but I shall still repeat it here anyway, that the geneticist Francis Crick uh, was under the influence of LSD when he uh, visualized the DNA double helix structure, a discovery for which he was also uh, jointly awarded the Nobel Prize. Now, clearly, this psychedelic DNA evidence isn't conclusive, far from it, um, but it does teach on the divide between what could be paranormal or just the, the power of the imagination uh, aided by the use of psychedelics. But um, had Narby just re rejected these accounts out of hand, as his academic background had, had told him to do, um, he would never have even attempted to verify the shaman's claims, uh, <coughs> let alone defend them. So I think we have some progress. Um, as an aside, perhaps uh, Auguste Kukule's uh, visions uh, could tend to support these scientists' uh, visions as well, who Kukule, as you all know, had a, a, an experience in a hypnagogic reverie where he envisaged the, the shape of the uh, undiscovered benzene ring at that time um, by seeing a snake eating its own tail. However, we suspect there was no drugs involved in that particular occasion because this was back in 1862, um, when the only psychedelic substance at that time available was nitrous oxide, of which we know William James made some uh, very good use of, of course. Now, James, as you all know, came up with a, a lot of very good stuff, and his, uh, at least I respect him for his psychical research and his philosophy, but his experiences on nitrous oxide didn't really produce many more benzene rings um, rather a few circular attempts at bringing back the ineffable meaning of life and the universe. Great uh, Rumsfeldian phrases like, there are no differences, but differences of degree between different degrees of difference and no difference. <laughs> when he thought he'd actually discovered the meaning of life and the universe. So clearly it isn't always useful. Uh, James aside, uh, Kekule wasn't the only one who made chemical discoveries in a, in a reverie. Uh, the Swiss chemist uh, Albert Hoffman had what he called a peculiar presentiment and uh, broke his strict laboratory protocol by going to investigate an, an apparently inactive chemical he had created five years earlier. And the chemical in question, of course, was LSD-25. And this was just one of a number of ergot-derived compounds he had uh, isolated several years previously. And in 1943, he resynthesized the compound um, as he later confessed because he said it spoke to him. And he accidentally ingested a small amount of it and he found himself having the first ever LSD trip known to man. Uh, during which time he, he also had the first ever LSD induced uh, out of body experience. I can also now report that many, many other people have also had uh, one since as well. Incidentally, uh, Albert Hoffman was um, recently voted, whilst he was still alive, the, the greatest living genius, according to a random survey of 4,000 Britons, uh, and I think that might be partly why. It's here at the very dawning of, of the field of psychedelic research that we find these strong, we could say, covalent bonds that were forming with the study of parapsychology. In the 1950s, before LSD found its way out of the Swiss laboratories, a medical doctor in London uh, by the name of John Smithies had began experimenting with mescaline. Now, mescaline at that time had been uh, under the radar. It had been um, isolated from peyote way back in 1886, but it had only been uh, researched by a handful of, of scientists. And one of the few accounts of its use at that time was reported in is my bad pronunciation, Les Revues Métasychiques, uh, by the French researcher Rouillet in the 1920s, who gave an extract, uh, how did I do that? Oh, yeah, it's okay. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it gave an extract of peyote to six participants, <laughs> one of which had a, a, a very compelling account of ESP. He was able to describe a number of things in a room next door, uh, which even other people weren't aware of. In 1950, anyway, Smithies, who was a member of the Society for Psychical Research at that time, and I think he still is, he's probably one of the, the longest living members in, in the SPR at, the, at this time, uh, he conducted clairvoyance experiments with some moderate success. And uh, about this time, Smith is also gave mescaline to his medical colleague uh, in uh, Guy's Hospital, uh, Dr. Humphrey Osmond. And then the pair of them headed off to Saskatchewan to continue their research uh, more easily. Um, by 1952, after some further experimentation, uh, Osmond and Smithies published an article in the Hibbit Journal where they suggested that we needed a, a new theory of mind which could account for the extraordinary experiences that occur with mescaline and that could also account for the what they considered to be the scientifically proven fact of ESP. Now the English novelist uh, Aldous Huxley read that article and requested that Osmond should visit him uh, in, in the US and give him some mescaline. Now, Osmond, wishing to oblige, did just that, and, and following Huxley's now classic mescaline experience, the two men generated the, the term we have now, psychedelic. Um, now, leading from that experience, Huxley uh, also catalyzed the popularization of psychedelics with the publication of The, the Doors of Perception in 1954. And he described his experiences on mescaline. And he also put forward a very simple neurochemical model of uh, ESP, of psi by suggesting that the French philosopher Henri Bergson uh, <laughs> was right to propose that the brain's primary function was to filter out all the excess sensory data that we do not attend to, uh, the data which would otherwise overwhelm our consciousness with uh, irrelevant information, information irrelevant to our survival. Now, Huxley also added to Bergson's uh, notion by suggesting these substances such as mescaline, could override what he called the brain's reducing valve and inhibit the sensory data, thereby allowing man to access the entire information available in the universe. Um, so he thereby suggested that psychedelics could in induce psi. And to illustrate this point, Huxley took the title of his, of his book from the quote by the English mystic, um, William Blake, who Russell uh, earlier quoted. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. Similar things were going on elsewhere in the psychedelic research. In 1953, just prior to uh, publication of Huxley's book, another important event was uh, occurring. The American banker and amateur mycologist uh, Gordon Wasson was fresh from his first trip down to Mexico, where he discovered both uh, the first... Uh, active mushroom cult and uh, the identity of uh, psilocybin cubensis as a sacramental they, they used uh, amongst the, uh, the Mazatec Indians. Uh, and he met with a Mazatec shaman by the name of Don Arulio. And he held a mushroom ceremony for Gordon Wasson and he told him two things about uh, his son back home that neither Wasson or Don Arulio could have possibly known and they both turned out to be true, although one of them hadn't yet happened at that time. So demonstrating something like precognition and clairvoyance under the influence of psilocybin mushrooms. A few years later, in 1961, Arthur Kersler, who was advised to go and see both Timothy Leary and J.B. Ryan at Duke, which he probably did, um, he went to see Leary first, and Leary had been experimenting with psilocybin, and uh, one of the active principles of the mushroom discovered by Gordon Wasson and with his colleague uh, Richard Alpert, who's now known as Ram Das, they uh, flew down to uh, Duke University in a private plane with a bottle of psilocybin and um, met up with J.B. Ryan. Now, no fruitful ESP research came out of that meeting. Um, partially, I am told, uh, was due to uncontrollable laughter during the attempted experiment, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Nevertheless, Kersler had a uh, very bad trip and lived through what he said was World War III. Uh, but J.B. Ryan ha later wrote to Timothy Leary and said the experience had been extremely illuminating. 
Nevertheless, uh, Leary's uh, tune in turn on dropout antics uh, soon alienated many researchers at that time, including JB, and uh, that pursuit of research discontinued. The 60s continued, though, however, and a number of experimental sci research programs utilizing psychedelics popped up over those years, such as those by uh, Carl Osis, uh, Walter Panke, Ernesto Cervadillo. Uh, Robert Masters, uh, and Gene Houston. However, with the growing tide of the hippie counterculture and the widespread public use of psychedelics and its ensuing moral panic, uh, psychedelics were condemned as illegal in the late 1960s and along with that, scientific research also stopped uh, at that time, the world over pretty much. Up until the, from then until the turn of the millennia, um, when Dick Bierman actually conducted some interesting Gansfeld experiments using cannabis and psilocybin uh, in Amsterdam, of course. You can do that anywhere else, I don't think. There were only 17 separately published reports of psychedelic psi experiments, or psychedelic experiments, I suppose. Uh, apart from Dick's research, nearly all of them lacked adequate controls and were far from being conclusive or even evidential uh, to some degree. Um, most of the studies used very naive participants who had never taken any psychedelic substance before. Uh, they usually succumbed to what was described as the mystical rapture of their first experience. And uh, they frequently complained that the ESP tasks they were given to do the card guessing were uh, psychedelically immoral or very boring um, whilst they were under the influence. Nevertheless, those experiments that utilised uh, less naive participants and had a better methodology tended to produce uh, better results. And the findings overall are, could be considered at least promising and warrant uh, further study. Uh, this assertion tends to be supported too when we look elsewhere in the literature. Uh, there are stories abound in the anthropological, ethnobotanical and the historical literature um, and these are also extremely pre prevalent among reports of psychedelic psychotherapists, of which there were many uh, during the 1960s. Uh, reviews are, sorry, I did a review of the surveys as well, um, conducted uh, since that time. And they showed, a, a consistently showed, a positive uh, relationship between reports of having paranormal experiences and the reported use of psychedelics with heavier users tending to have more experiences. Uh, overall, between 18% and a staggering 83% of, of people reporting the use of cannabis or, or psychedelic substances also report um, psi or ESP experiences under the influence of those substances, so whilst, they, whilst they're actually tripping. Unfortunately, I would say, since prohibition in the 1960s, uh, survey research has been pretty much all the kind of research that's been able to be conducted and uh, all human research effectively ended in 1966 when LSD was criminalized. Uh, psychedelic research at that time and the word psychedelic became a, a dirty w word in science and in medical research and it's at that point that parapsychology and psychedelic research kind of uh, went their different ways, parted company. A parapsychologist long suffering the brunt of zealous critics anyway uh, could no longer risk tarnishing their brush anymore uh, with, with the taint uh, of the likes of Leary. And uh, the few tenacious psychedelic researchers who had kept the candle burning um, in their own field uh, also felt that what little credibility they had couldn't be risked by dabbling in sigh. Um, so both fields went their separate ways. They became too fringe for each other. Now, this situation remained for much of the following decades until the mid 1990s when a few brave researchers started, uh, um, such as medical doctor Rick Strassman, started risking their careers to ask the unaskable questions. Uh, so, defying taboos, they persisted with the ethics boards and the government agencies often for several years, uh, I think it took Rick Strassman about three years to get the approvals to do research with DMT. Uh, but he, he persisted and uh, pockets of research then started popping up in the 1990s 
So about that by the turn of the millennium, there were a whole number of, of research projects starting in, into the use of psychedelics, mostly for therapeutic purposes. Uh, this, was, this feat was helped by the formation of organisations like uh, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, acronym MAPS, uh, based in the US, and uh, the Beckley Foundation, based in the uh, UK in Oxford. And these organisations privately fundraised millions of dollars to, to continue this research, uh, collecting money from sympathetic philanthropists, um, they ch channeled it into respectable, ethically approved institutional research. Um, substances such as psilocybin, MDMA, cannabis. Um, the Beckley Foundation, for instance, initiated the first uh, project giving LSD to humans in, in 40 years just recently. Uh, the current situation with psychedelic research is now such that we are beginning to see a, the start of, of a complete renaissance, I think. Um, there are currently projects running at several prestigious universities such as Harvard, uh, John Hopkins universities. Uh, we've been approached by organisations, uh, Yale for instance, has requested funding to do psychedelic research. So this seems to be back on the agenda. And this is something truly remarkable. If you think about this, there was substances that were demonised and, and prohibited for study for several decades are now beginning to make a return to academia. Um, and they did this by not changing their name or changing their effects. Uh, although some researchers urged to use the kind of different names such as uh, entheogens, which hopefully duck under the radar, the vanguard of advocates for this research continued to talk of them as psychedelics. Um, even though for, for decades this was loaded with uh, lots of negative baggage. Now I perceive there were two major factors that helped bring about this change in the weather. The, the first of which was the passage of time and the gradual demise of the media hysteria generated in the 60s. And the second was the persistent affirmation by serious scientists, academics and therapists who worked uh, closely and directly with these substances that they were essentially safe and had many potential benefits to be gained if, and I say if, and this is the big caveat, if they were used in the right way. So the message here is that at length, the truth will out. Many people who had come into contact with psychedelics recognized their beneficial aspects and were willing to risk their careers and donate money to see their, them researched for these purposes despite the lack of government funding and the active resistance from the establishment. Now clearly we can probably see some parallels here with our own field. Uh, a valuable lesson could possibly be learned here for parapsychology is that we need not hide our interests or change our names or change what we, the name of what we do or of what we research but rather just speak truth to power and continue to persevere in spite of mainstream opposition and maintain our integrity as seekers of truth, whatever and wherever that may be. I haven't finished, but thank you. <laughs> it's not long, I'm nearly there. Um, <laughs> news in just this week is that uh, the results of a study into the benefits of MDMA for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And now the findings of this uh, research have been published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology, a very prestigious journal. Uh, the findings are highly positive. Uh, MDMA is very beneficial in the treatment of long-term PTSD, at least in this one study. And um, this is the first study to, on MDMA to report positive effects as potential beneficial use in 25 years when it was criminalized. Uh, in that time, there's been three and a half thousand studies published about MDMA, none of which have been even investigated the potential benefits of them. So I think we're beginning to see the inkling of a, of a renaissance in, in uh, the study of psychedelics, at least. Uh, I'm an out and out optimist as well, and I think we're also beginning to see the, the renaissance in parapsychology as well. Uh, certainly in the UK, we now have more university departments researching and teaching uh, the psychology and sociology of the paranormal uh, than there have ever been. Uh, the number 
of which has pretty much doubled in the last 10 years, I would say. Uh, in the last count, there were 16 uh, psychology departments, sociology departments as well, teaching parapsychology and doing research. Um, it's also now sneaked its way onto the pre-university syllabus as well, and psychology syllabus in the UK. Uh, there are now tens of thousands of 16 to 18 year old students who are studying psychology who would be given exposure to, to parapsychology in the UK. And I envisage that this situation will continue and here in uh, France and in the US and elsewhere, hopefully across the globe. So if we really are starting to see uh, a more open-minded approach to science, uh, then is there room in that equation for return to the parapsychological investigation of psychedelics, of shamanism, and other anthropological subject matter? <clears throat> I think there is. Uh, when the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS, was started up by Rick Doblin 24 years ago, um, in its mission statement, they said that they believe that psychedelics could be beneficial to psychic research, uh, among other things. And MAPS, uh, true to their objectives, have funded uh, this kind of research since then. Now, this brings affairs full circle from the time in the early 1960s when the Parapsychology Foundation were funding uh, Leary's research at Harvard using psilocybin to re rehabilitate prisoners. And uh, perhaps our erstwhile speaker tomorrow is going to say a bit more about other foundations, uh, psychedelic research foundations, uh, taking an interest in parapsychological research. And I think this reciprocity is, is timely. It indicates uh, perhaps a time now again to start asking these questions between the relationship of psychedelic and uh, parapsychological phenomena. Uh, which is a broader field, I'll go back to this idea then, it encompasses both neurobiology, psychopharmacology, phytochemistry, ethnobotany, anthropology, archaeology, and eco and transpersonal psychology. What can be learned from this enterprise? Uh, investigating what I mischievously like to call parapsychopharmacology, uh, we can probably learn something about neurochemistry underlying these uh, parapsychological processes. Given that people generally report, report far more of these uh, phenomena, or these experiences at least, uh, under the influence of psychedelics than not, uh, then the discovery about the neurochemistry applies whether these experiences are genuine or not as well because then we can at least learn something about the experiences if nothing else. Nevertheless the state of neurochemistry is extremely complex affair uh, so a sophisticated approach is needed to unravel the intricacies of human and chemical interaction. This includes an investigation of situation person variables such as Chris Rowe and uh, Nicola Holt's recent research looking at uh, person liability and system liability. There are also a wealth of different psychedelic substances. Um, these have been increasing in number in their discovery by a factor of 10 every 50 years uh, since uh, 1900, according to uh, Alexander Shulgin. Uh, psychedelic expert is actually <laughs> probably responsible for making half of those though so he would say that um, it's also considered there are a wealth of different extraordinary experiences people have on these substances as well uh, in this regard there's a lot to be learned from the lineage of, of shamans who have been using these substances for millennia and who are well practiced in navigating the altered states they produce from this research and from the literature, it seems that most every type of uh, paranormal, ostensibly, and transpersonal experience can be had under the influence of these substances. And they may teach us something about the phenomena uh, that are being studied uh, in psychical research ordinarily. For instance, apparent contact with discarnate entities, which is highly prevalent under the influence of uh, DMT, which is a naturally occurring psychedelic in our own brain. I think Rick, Rick Strassman estimated that 50% of people have an encounter with a discarnate entity uh, when they take DMT for the first time. And this can probably inform our studies of mediumship, uh, of apparitions, of alien and abduction experiences, um, among other things. 
Um, however, the multitude of these complex experiences means that a taxonomic approach is required and ultimately determine which substances under which environmental conditions and for which people best activate a particular sort of experience, i.e. what experiences arise out of the combination of set, setting and substance. Now that's a lot of factors and a lot of questions to ask. Um, so you see this is a completely uh, nascent um, juvenile field of, of study at this point and it's wise to admit that we know virtually nothing. Um, now one insight that might, uh, we might begin with is, is that of Théophile de Gautier, the founder of Les Clubs de Hachachin uh, here in Paris, not far from here. It was a long time ago now. I don't think it's still open. Um, but he once had an experience outside of time in which 15 minutes passed by in what felt like just a couple of centuries. Um, now, perhaps an experience like that can help us unravel some of the paradoxes and mysteries that occur with precognition. Um, and this seems like a good starting point as any. Um, so I thank you for your attention and this short journey down the rabbit hole. Um, down, 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 as Alice said, would the fall never come to an end? Okay, thank you.